So welcome everyone to this week's Medical Grand Round at Flinders. Uh, apologies that it's a, a day late. We had a few uh, technical issues yesterday. Uh, some of you might think there might be some complex YouTube algorithm by Cambridge Analytica that uh, blocks any broadcasting of things that has critical comments of Donald Trump and vaccines in the same sentence. I'm sure it's not, not that. Um, you'll also recognise that some vaccines need uh, two shots, not one. So I'm very grateful to, to Nick <laughs> for his second shot at, at this presentation and, and to uh, Andrew and Kate for help, help facilitating it. Um, look, Nick Petrovsky is well known to many of you. He's uh, an endocrinologist with particular interest in diabetes. He's um, been involved in vaccine research over an extended period of time with particular interests in improving uh, vaccines with, with adjuvants. And Nick's been involved in the development of COVID-19 vaccines at the moment, a subject which one hard to imagine a greater uh, medical and, and, and social and political importance. And given the number of people that tried to listen yesterday, as most we've ever had tried to dial in, uh, we thought it was really important to give Nick an opportunity to, to be heard again. So uh, Nick, thanks for your forbearance with this. Uh, looking forward to your talk today about the state of progress in the development of COVID-19 vaccines. Thanks, Nick. So j thanks, Jonathan. And I think, um, you know, there's no surprise the last nine months has, has been a, a whirlwind journey for, for all of us uh, dealing with, with this new pandemic. I'm going to just start the talk by giving some background to, to COVID-19 uh, and then really go into the various vaccine technologies that uh, are out there. Uh, as potential candidates and, and then just give you a little bit uh, of insight into some of the work that, that we've been doing. Uh, but really the, the major thrust of the talk is to give you an oversight of, of what's happening in the, the vaccine space for COVID-19. So just fast forwarding uh, to yesterday. Um, so where are we now um, essentially nine months into the pandemic? Uh, well, as, as you'll be aware, we, we now have over uh, or, or, or just under 40 million reported cases worldwide with uh, over a million deaths. Uh, Australia's been uh, very fortunate um, and we've only had 27,000 or so cases uh, with less than 1,000 deaths. And at the other extreme for a developed country is the United States, which really has shocked a lot of people uh, given that their, their extremely high caseload with 8 million cases and already over 200,000 uh, deaths. And, and again, uh, one can speculate about why the US has, has really done uh, so badly on the world stage when it's come to managing this particular uh, pandemic. Again, Given this is a clinical audience, I'm not going to go into a, a lot of the clinical features of COVID-19, which I'm sure many of the audience are, are more familiar with even than I am. Uh, suffice to say that, you know, it's, it's caused by a, a novel uh, virus, a, a coronavirus. Um, the closest known relative to this virus has, has been identified in, in bats, uh, but we still don't know how the virus has moved uh, from a bat virus to a human virus and there's been a lot of speculation about that and in fact we've done some research on the origins which does suggest the possibility at least that this is actually uh, a virus that's escaped from a laboratory uh, where it was being studied rather than necessarily being a natural transmission but that's not again the focus of today's talk. We know that the virus is transmitted by respiratory droplets, it's very efficient in its transmission uh, and also it, it, it can be by touching contaminated surface and then touching uh, the mouth or, or other mucosal surfaces after coming in contact with the virus. Typically there's an incubation period where people are asymptomatic for about seven days uh, and then most people will get one to two weeks of symptomatic disease uh, before either recovering or progressing to more serious uh, disease. Um, it's characterised by a wide spectra of symptoms, uh, very similar to other upper respiratory tract infections such as influenza with cough and fever and myalgia. 
uh, progressing to viral pneumonia uh, and in severe cases to respiratory failure and, and in some cases unfortunately uh, to death. Uh, the typical time from onset of symptoms uh, to hospitalisation is, is about one week uh, and three quarters of cases are now known to be asymptomatic yet remain infectious and so almost certainly these are the, the cause of the outbreaks that we periodically see in, in regions that have otherwise brought it under control is these asymptomatic uh, carriers. People might ask why is a, an endocrinologist trying to develop a COVID-19 vaccine and in fact there is a very close connection between COVID-19 and, and diabetes uh, and we now know that diabetes is one of the major uh, risk factors for severity of COVID-19 infection and in fact uh, a COVID-19 mortality. Uh, about one-fifth of ICU patients with COVID-19 have diabetes uh, and, and we know that the mortality rate, if people do have diabetes and contract the virus, is about three times higher than people without uh, diabetes. Um, there are other comorbidities that are associated with severe disease, which include hypertension and cardiovascular disease. And, and as you'll be aware, these are comorbidities of diabetes, explaining why diabetics uh, really stand out. Uh, in terms of disease severity. Perhaps surprisingly, people with existing lung disease have a relatively low uh, increased uh, risk of se serious uh, disease relative to hypertension, diabetes and cardiovascular disease. In terms of why diabetes might particularly be associated with um, severe COVID-19 uh, infections, uh, we do know that diabetes was also uh, a major risk factor uh, during the SARS coronavirus outbreak and also during MERS uh, periodic outbreaks over the last 10 years. Uh, and in fact, diabetes was a major risk factor for ICU admission and mortality uh, during the 2009 uh, swine flu uh, pandemic. So, so diabetes does seem to put you at much higher risk of any of these serious uh, respiratory pathogens from getting uh, serious disease. Uh, and, and the reason for that, um, you know, it may not be as simple as, as we imagine. We do know that diabetes, uh, as, as a, um, it stands, is associated with impaired immune function and obviously foot infections and gangrene are very common in people with diabetes, so it tells us that um, diabetes per se uh, results in some suppression of the immune response and we do know that people with poor glycemic control uh, with high blood sugars have a, even further impaired immune responses and this has already been shown with COVID-19 uh, where poor glycemic control was associated with much worse outcomes if, if people with diabetes did become infected with COVID-19. Uh, so good glycemic control, just as it is for the long-term management of complications, is important uh, if we're to reduce morbidity and mortality in, in diabetic patients if they contract this virus. We also know that many people with type 2 diabetes are obese, and obesity again is uh, being as associated during previous pandemics such as swine flu uh, with increased rates of risk of hospitalisation, ICU admission and mortality. Uh, and the main reason for this seems to be that abdominal obesity is associated with uh, splinting of the diaphragm and reduced lung volumes. And obviously if you have impaired lung function on top of this, not surprisingly these people will go into respiratory failure faster. Um, the other factor that may be specific to COVID-19 is that uh, the receptor for the virus is actually ACE2 angiotensin converting enzyme 2 and we know that ACE2 expression is increased in people with high blood pressure or diabetes uh, and this may make it easier for the virus both to infect their respiratory tract but also to spread uh, to other organs in the body and so may make uh, put these people with blood high blood pressure or, or diabetes at particularly high risk from this specific viral infection that uses ACE2 uh, to, to enter the body. How does COVID-19 compare to other uh, viral outbreaks? Um, 
Well, uh, uh, you know, in terms of mortality rates and fatality rates, I guess Ebola still stands at the top in terms of, of the most lethal human virus that, that we, we know, uh, with mortality rates up to 80% of people who get infected, although now we, we do have some therapies which have reduced this, uh, fortunately. Um, in the middle, we, we really have the, um, you know, the influenzas and particularly the, the pandemic influenzas as we saw with H1N1 uh, in 2009, um, you know, which infected a large percentage of the world's population, but uh, was only associated with 284,000 estimated global deaths, mainly because the case fatality rate was very low uh, ranging from 0.001% uh, mortality uh, uh, in children who are infected up to a 1% uh, mortality in, in the elderly who got infected. So uh, overall the number of deaths was low be uh, because of this low case fatality rate, not because a lot of people didn't get it. Uh, with COVID-19 we have something in the middle um, and, and I guess that's why it's so scary. Um, is, is that the, the case fatality rate uh, is, is currently estimated at 2.8% based on, on diagnosed cases of 38 million uh, with a million deaths. Uh, but because there's, there's almost certainly uh, a, a two to three times more cases than uh, have been diagnosed, uh, the, the case fatality rate overall is, is certainly less than 1%. Uh, but because it's infecting so many people, it means the total number of deaths is going to be uh, almost certainly very high and certainly uh, probably of the order of one of the worst pandemics of the last uh, 100 years or so because the, the million deaths to date is still quite low relative to where this might go given only about 10% of the world's population uh, would have currently have been exposed to the virus. So, so we're still only a, a short way into to what may uh, eventuate in terms of uh, total deaths with this pandemic. If we look at, at, at sort of what's happening today around the world, uh, the, the highest caseload now is in India, uh, which, which started late, uh, but, but has obviously given its large population um, surged up the rankings in terms of total numbers uh, of cases per day, which is, is currently of the order of 70,000 uh, new diagnosed infections each day in India, uh, passing the United States. But as you'll appreciate, the United States has a much lower population than India, so actually on a per population basis, the US is doing much, much worse than even India, which as I say, has come as a surprise uh, to a lot of people. If we look over time at what's happened, um, then you know we have uh, uh, examples of, of countries such as Australia that had small surges uh, early uh, in the year. Uh, but then implemented uh, social isolation and quarantine policies and were able to actually break that what we call first wave and really have gone down to have very low levels of, of disease in the community with very little community spread. Um, we, we have the case uh, in green here of India which started much later and people were wondering why is India sort of seem protected, but of course it was just a matter of time and now we're seeing an exponential rise in cases uh, and then with very strict policies. So now in India, it's illegal to leave your house without a mask anywhere in India. Uh, and if you do, uh, the police uh, lock you in jail and beat you up as we've seen on YouTube. Um, and so in response to those policies of social isolation, we've seen a, a, a reduction in caseloads in India, but it's still very high at around 60,000 cases a day. The United States is interestingly, because they now say that really, although it looks like they've had three waves, the first one in, in April, the second in July, and, and more recently this one, which we can call the presidential election uh, wave, 
uh, uh, the, the people at the NIH I was just talking to this morning and they're saying, no, it's not really the third wave, it's just we've never actually ever properly controlled the first wave because as you can see, it only ever flattened off, it never actually got brought back down close to baseline before it took off again. Uh, so, so as I say, in different parts of the world with different policies, we've seen quite different uh, patterns of, of disease. Uh, obviously, Europe was hit very hard early uh, in the year. In, in March, you know, we had really a medical crisis in northern Italy uh, with an extremely fast uh, rising caseload that overran their, their hospitals. Um, and then that was brought under control again just by strict social isolation policies. Really came down very close to baseline. They relaxed over summer. Uh, and as you can see, uh, caseloads in Italy are now back to the very peak of where they were uh, when they were in crisis mode in, in March. So that's not looking good, given that they're just currently going into winter. So this may get a lot worse before it gets better. And similarly, the United Kingdom is not really looking uh, much better than, than, it, uh, than Italy right now in terms of extremely high caseloads uh, going into the start of their, their winter. The other problem with COVID-19, and this comes to the, the sort of fallacy of the, the herd Im, natural herd immunity philosophy that's still being propagated, unfortunately, by policymakers in some countries, but was really exemplified, I guess, by Boris Johnson in the United Kingdom, uh, you know, Donald Trump in the US, and I think also the, the president of Sweden, who said rather than having to actually do anything, wouldn't it be just simpler to let COVID-19 sweep through the community? You know, a few people might die, but everyone else will recover and then life can go back to, to, to normal and this won't cost us anything, um, you know, apart from, from some extra sort of uh, cremations. Um, you know, it sounded very politically palatable because it meant you really had to do nothing. The, unfortunately, if you look at it scientifically, it's completely and utterly flawed and was never going to actually work. Um, and that's for several reasons. One is that we don't know how long immunity from natural infection lasts, but we're already seeing people uh, coming down with secondary infections, uh, you know, three to four months after a primary infection. So we know that almost certainly the, the duration of immunity is probably with natural infection gonna be very short. Which, which makes it very hard to actually uh, build herd immunity if people uh, who've had infection actually become susceptible again that quickly uh, and can again spread virus the second time just like they did the first. Um, so, so really that goes to the fallacy of the idea that you can build uh, natural herd immunity from infection. Uh, the other problem is that it assumes that, that the vast majority of people who you're going to let get infected uh, are going to recover in a few weeks with no residual uh, medical problems from that. And I, I guess there's increasing uh, evidence around the world um, that that is not necessarily the case, that a lot of people who have suffered and, and recovered uh, technically from the infection and become virus negative on PCR uh, may have long-term residual problems related to their infection. Uh, both neurological but, but also in other organs including long-term damage to the lung and heart and we don't know where that will end up uh, in five or ten years in those individuals. So to, to blindly let people be infected not knowing the outcomes of that infection um, does sound a little bit um, like lunacy. Um, and, and, and the converse is that we know that even without a vaccine, you know, we can control COVID-19 transmission in the community um, and, and bring it under control. So we can avoid the vast majority of people getting infected uh, and keep them away from the virus, not knowing what the long-term effects of infection are. And that would seem to be the most sensible strategy, I think, to most of us, uh, would be to keep people virus free. Um, just in case there are long-term consequences of infection. So we know that for COVID-19, it really comes down to the R0, which is the transmission rate. 
Um, if we can get the R0 under, under 1 so that less than one person is infected by each infected person, then the virus will die out. And uh, we know that from, particularly from SARS, where just with, with quarantine measures, we, could, we reduced the R0, and SARS stopped being a problem after 12 months and hasn't been back in the human population since. Unfortunately, the right policies were not implemented at the start of COVID-19. Otherwise, like SARS, it might have truly been a three or four month sort of uh, uh, blip on the horizon, and we may actually have eradicated COVID-19 from the human population, but that is not going to be the case now. And, and arguably we're never going to actually free humanity of COVID-19 because the right policies were not taken at the time when we had the opportunity to eradicate it. Uh, so now all we can do is control it, but we know that by using the appropriate strategies, <coughs> including social isolation, uh, hand washing, face masks, that it is quite easy to bring the R naught under one. Um, and if we do that, again, it dies out locally. Uh, and this is just an example of that in Hong Kong where they've mapped the different uh, policies uh, and procedures in terms of controlling the outbreak. And as you can see that about two or three weeks after you bring the R naught under one, just, and it doesn't have to be a long way under one, the, the outbreak dies away spontaneously. So we should never forget that, that we do have procedures that can control uh, this virus and its community spread. But ultimately, you know, that's, that only lasts so long. People get a bit upset if, if they have to be socially isolated too long, as we've seen in many countries of the world, people getting very antsy after prolonged periods of having to stay at home. Um, and that's why we desperately do need a vaccine but we have to balance that with the fact that you can't just magically make a vaccine in a few months and expect it to be safe and effective. You know, we need time and that's where social isolation policies are really about buying us time until we can get that safe and effective vaccine and make it available to everyone. Um, so we definitely need vaccines and, and, and I think we also have to accept pandemics are a fact of life. Uh, and probably with the, the world's population increasing, intrusion on, on places, you know, uh, wild places where, where bats are, which harbour a lot of these viruses and, and other wild animals, that we're going to see more pandemics probably in the future than we've actually even seen uh, in the past. So we need to have strategies in place where we can have vaccine platforms already developed and ready to go uh, so we don't have to start from scratch each new pandemic. And fortunately, we've had funding from the US government for the last 20 years or so to do exactly that, to design vaccine platforms against pandemic influenza, no matter which strain, uh, and also against pandemic coronaviruses, including SARS, MERS, and now COVID-19, which is why we've been able to move so swiftly uh, to develop our COVID-19 vaccine. It's really building on 20 years of developing uh, that platform. So what we know about COVID-19 in terms of uh, addressing it uh, with a vaccine, and, and, and we knew this from, from our experience with SARS and MERS coronaviruses, is all of these coronaviruses express a, a particular protein on their surface, which sticks out, gives it the crown-like look, uh, and is called the spike protein. And this protein is critical to the ability of the virus to bind to human cells, uh, invade them, and then start replicating. Uh, so if you can interfere in this process by generating immune response against the spike protein, uh, then you can actually uh, potentially prevent infection in the first place. But even if you fail to prevent the initial infection by inducing T cells against the spike protein, uh, then the initial cells in the respiratory tract that can infected can get recognised by those T cells, which can, can then kill the infected cell. Uh, and again, that stops the virus being able to replicate and cause clinical disease. So with our vaccine, we know that targeting the spike protein is the vulnerability uh, of, of the virus. And, and we showed in, in animal models, including camels, uh, which we vaccinated for MERS and then they were challenged with MERS 
uh, a, a coronavirus and, and similarly for, for mice with SARS coronavirus, we could get very good protection of those animals by, by using that vaccine strategy. But if, if we're talking vaccines and why it's difficult to roll out a vaccine in a short space of time, um, then, then, you know, the biggest challenge is one, you know, vaccine discovery using traditional pro approaches is, is very inefficient. So, you know, at the moment we have a couple of hundred vaccine candidates for COVID-19 around the world. Uh, you know, we'll be lucky if a handful of those end up as approved vaccines. So you can just see the, the, the massive attrition rates uh, in terms of, of the development process. So we don't have guaranteed vaccines that are guaranteed to work. So we, we, we use this inefficient system of, of really developing um, uh, lots of different candidates and then hope that one will work. Uh, this is a very expensive process. So this is actually an old slide, which estimated that it, it, the cost of a, a single new drug or vaccine uh, a few years ago was already about 2.6 billion US dollars. Uh, that's almost getting up to, to 4 billion Australian dollars to make a single vaccine or a single new drug. So it's a very, very inefficient and expensive process. The other challenge that we have in developing a pandemic vaccine uh, is that typically, you know, a vaccine takes somewhere between 15 to 20 years to develop. Uh, and this is based on all the vaccines we currently have available, took this period of time. You know, usually you have to spend about five to 10 years doing the initial manufacture of the different candidates, then testing them in various different animal models to get them working. Uh, you know, and then you, it takes another 10 years or so going through the various phases of clinical trials before you get final approval. Here we're trying to compress that ideally into 12 months or, or less to go all the way from identification of the virus, characterising the virus, to getting an approved vaccine. And some would say that's simply not uh, possible and obviously you know, we're, we're nine or 10 months in and we still don't have one, although hopefully we will by early next year. So what we've been doing for the last 20 years or so is, is you know, with funding from, from the National Institutes of Health in the United States, is to try and think about how do we make vaccine design smarter and faster and cheaper. Uh, and so we've been taking a, a range of approaches uh, to do this. Uh, particularly focused on use of artificial intelligence and computational design, uh, because this is a lot faster than trying to do things in, in the lab. Uh, but we've also used a, a, a number of fancy new technologies like single cells transcriptomics to characterise uh, the, the effectiveness of our vaccines. Uh, and as you will, uh, I think most people will be aware, for the first time there's a whole lot of different delivery uh, platforms for vaccines being tested in humans, including uh, DNA vaccines and RNA vaccines, uh, but also a whole lot of uh, genetically manipulated viruses uh, are being used. So, so there's a whole lot of new platforms, I guess, uh, available. Just to say this isn't just sort of theoretical, the idea that we can do things differently. Uh, last year, uh, we had the first vaccine in the world that's ever been developed using artificial intelligence uh, go into human clinical trials in the United States uh, as part of a, a seasonal influenza vaccine. So it does show that, you know, this isn't just theoretical, but it can be turned into practical reality very quickly. If we look at where the vaccines are today for COVID-19, so this is the breakdown of the different vaccines um, and, and their different stages. And as you can see, there, there's, a, there's about 50 vaccines now in humans. Uh, we were actually 16th in the world uh, to go into human trials, which we thought was a, a pretty good achievement. Uh, but obviously there's been a large number of vaccines come in behind us in the last uh, three months or so. Um, and we've had a few candidates. We yet, don't yet have an approved vaccine anywhere in the world, uh, but we have some in Russia and China where the government have just chosen to start giving these to specific uh, populations without waiting 
uh, for the outcome of phase three clinical trials of which there's a 11 vaccines currently uh, in phase three around uh, the world. So a lot of people ask, well, you know, what's different about your vaccine and, 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 and uh, you know, essentially, you know, which vaccine platform or type of vaccine do you think is going to be the most successful? And we hear a lot in the media uh, about uh, uh, adenovirus uh, vector vaccines, and this is exemplified by the Oxford and uh, AstraZeneca and, and more recently CSL has joined into that uh, uh, consortia um, uh, ar around uh, the chimpanzee adenovirus uh, vector uh, uh, COVID uh, vaccine. Obviously, this has never been tested in humans before, so it's a very experimental uh, technology, which is always going to be fraught with, with risk. Um, but uh, 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 obviously, it's probably the one that has had the most media attention, uh, mainly because it was the first vaccine to go into to humans only uh, a few months after the, the virus was first identified. Um, the other, uh, I guess, focus of the media has been on the nucleic acid vaccines, both RNA uh, and DNA vaccines. And again, the reason is not these are the best technologies, because again, they've never been tested in humans before or shown to be effective. Again, it was because they were the fastest uh, to get into the phase one human trials uh, several months into the pandemic. So it's rather ironic, I guess, that the, the, the technologies that have really received the vast majority of the media attention and the vast majority of, of funding um, and, and uh, are in fact the, the least proven of all technologies that we potentially have available. Uh, if we look at more reliable and more proven technologies, then we have inactivated viruses. So this goes back to Louis Pasteur, uh, you know, hundreds of years ago where the very original vaccines were largely just uh, viruses that were, were killed with formalin uh, and then injected. Uh, and the Chinese certainly have a number of inactivated virus uh, vaccines for COVID uh, that are in now phase three uh, clinical development, uh, but are limited because the manufacturing is difficult because you have to do it under high level uh, biosecurity. And we don't have those sorts of manufacturing facilities in, in Australia or, or in the United States. So that leaves you really with the last approach, which is, is well validated, which is using what we call a subunit approach, which is based on synthetic proteins. Um, and, and, you know, we know that these approaches are extremely safe. Um, you know, a lot of our existing childhood vaccines are based on synthetic proteins. Uh, particularly the hepatitis B vaccine that all children get, uh, and also the human papilloma virus vaccine against uh, cervical cancer is again uh, a subunit uh, recombinant protein vaccine. So we know that these uh, subunit approaches are extremely effective, and the most important thing is they have extremely robust protection data uh, that covers thousands, well, billions of of immunized subjects, including young children uh, who've received these vaccines without incident. Um, so arguably, you know, if you had the choice, these are the, the, the types of vaccines you'd want. Um, but as I said, funnily enough, it's been the, the, the sort of unproven technologies that have received the most attention, uh, particularly the Oxford AstraZeneca CSL uh, adenovirus vaccine, which is essentially a, an adenovirus which causes uh, severe respiratory infections in chimpanzees. Uh, this has been genetically modified. It's still a live virus. Uh, and they've taken the gene for spike protein from the COVID virus and actually inserted this into this live virus adenovirus. Being an adenovirus, it infects the respiratory tract um, and, and this is given as an intramuscular injection. Uh, the virus enters cells in the body uh, and, and those cells then express the um, spike protein along with other proteins from the adenovirus. Uh, um, so that's the way in which it's, it's meant to work. Uh, uh, obviously, a few weeks ago, Scott Morrison as the Prime Minister announced that he was gonna make this vaccine mandatory for all Australians to have after he signed a $1.7 billion deal with CSL. 
uh, to secure supplies of that vaccine. There was quite a backlash to the idea that people be forced to have a very unproven uh, vaccine with uncertain long-term safety, given this has never been given to humans before. Um, and, and in fact, he backed down a little. And then, of course, a few weeks after that, AstraZeneca, in fact, a few days after his announcement, AstraZeneca put the, the, the clin phase three clinical trial on hold uh, over a safety concern of a patient that had uh, transverse myelitis. That clinical hold has since been released in the United Kingdom, but maintained uh, by the US FDA, who are doing further investigations uh, into that. Uh, then a couple of days ago, we had Johnson & Johnson, who are also developing another adenovirus uh, vaccine using the same or very similar approach, uh, announced that they were putting their phase three clinical trial on clinical hold. Uh, again, because of uh, a, 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 a serious adverse event in a subject, but we don't yet know uh, whether or not that was a neurological event in, in that case. Um, and, and obviously we don't have any details other than currently that trial uh, is not uh, uh, immunising any, any subjects. We've also seen obviously reports of, of serious side effects out of the nucleic acid vaccine trials. The Inovio DNA vaccine trial is also been put on clinical hold by the FDA uh, 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 in the last fortnight, uh, apparently over some questions about the, the electroporator device um, that was being used to deliver the DNA, but we don't know any, any more than that. Um, uh, Moderna and Pfizer, who are both developing mRNA uh, vaccines, uh, have, have published their phase one data, which did show a high rate of high fevers um, and symptoms in the subjects. But uh, so far, those uh, clinical trials are continuing uh, and haven't uh, had uh, the problem of a clinical hold. So about half the, the I, I guess, phase three trials uh, around the world are currently on clinical hold, which is good sign because it means that people are taking safety very seriously and particularly the FDA is taking uh, safety very seriously, which is very important. If we're going to give these vaccines to, to potentially billions of people, they have to be extraordinarily safe. And that's hard to prove when you have a technology that's never been given to humans before, I have to add. So, um, you know, giving it to t even 10,000 humans may not be enough to satisfy people that it is truly uh, safe. And that's going to be a problem both for nucleic acids, but also for uh, the viral based uh, approaches. A lot of people ask, well, wh what's the relationship with this case of transverse myelitis in the patient who received the Oxford vaccine? Uh, uh, and obviously transverse myelitis is an autoimmune process where you get demyelination of the spinal cord. Uh, we know that this can be triggered uh, by vaccinations, uh, particularly uh, the live polio uh, virus vaccine that we no longer use uh, did cause some episodes of this, but it can also happen after viral infections um, uh, and in people who develop autoimmune uh, problems for reasons we don't understand. So, so there is a plausible, I guess, connection between the Oxford because it's a, a live virus vaccine and, and potentially, you know, this uh, transverse myelitis. But obviously, you know, we can't say that for sure. So it's just a matter of, of monitoring the subjects as we go forward to see if this is going to be a recurring uh, adverse event, in which case you would argue that vaccine will not ultimately see the light of day. But as I say, at the moment, we simply don't know. The trial is continuing in the United Kingdom, and obviously the government there have invested hundreds of millions of pounds in that technology, so they have a vested interest in seeing it go forward. It's, it, it's maintained uh, a clinical hold in the United States by the FDA, uh, who are taking the, the I guess, the, the safety investigation more seriously before they allow that trial to resume. So that's on the safety side. So as I say, we have a lot of the phase three trials currently sort of a bit under a cloud, um, not all of them, uh, but it does mean that it isn't straightforward developing a vaccine in record time. And we do have to be careful about safety. The other thing that obviously we need to, to think about very carefully is what 
what will a, a, a successful vaccine look like? Like, what do we want that vaccine to do? Uh, and the FDA have put a lot of thought into this, um, but as it happens in terms of what, what's required to get a, an approval of your vaccine after phase three, is actually just to show at least a 50% reduction in episodes of viral infection and most of these are going to be very mild or even asymptomatic, largely asymptomatic infections uh, in the vaccinated group compared to the placebo group in the phase three trial. So that's the criteria to get the vaccine approved. Now, whether that's really the most important clinical criteria is another question, of course, because we know that it's not young, healthy adults who get mild disease that we worry about. It's the elderly or people with chronic disease, uh, including diabetes, who have a very high mortality rate that we really want to be protecting. But in fact, none of the clinical trials currently in phase three are actually looking at that question at all. So they're not asking, does the vaccine prevent hospitalization or does it prevent you know, admission to ICU ventilation or does it actually prevent death in high risk individuals? So even when we have approved vaccines, we won't know whether those vaccines are truly going to actually change uh, the, the mortality and, and, and the serious end of the disease um, spectra. So some people are arguing the design of the trials itself is problematic uh, in terms of how we use these vaccines uh, going forward. Um, the other thing is that, you know, the question of emergency use authorization. So do you really need to wait till the end of the phase three trial before you're allowed to start giving the vaccine to other people outside of trials? We've already seen China and Russia embrace that idea and just say, yep, you know, the government uh, just has approved the vaccine for use in other populations. They're not going to wait for the phase three trials to be completed. Obviously, countries that are more conservative, including the US, Europe and Australia, have not so far gone down that uh, route. But we may see that happen in Europe, for instance, if they have a bad enough outbreak, they may decide to actually throw the gates open and, you know, take a vaccine and say, let's start using it to see if we can uh, attenuate the, the outbreak. Um, so, so the FDA and, and uh, European authorities have said that um, what they would like to see to get an emergency use authorization is safety data in at least 3,000 study participants. So that's the low bar that you have to meet before you can even apply for such an authorization. Uh, and they're also recommending that patients in or, or subjects in these trials be followed up for at least one to two years because the other big unknown question is how long, even if a vaccine is protective, how long will the protection last for? And the answer is we, we have no idea whatsoever. I mean, the vaccines have only been, uh, you know, available for the last couple of months. So the longest we can say a vaccine might even in animal studies be effective. I think the longest study uh, that's been done in monkeys, it was like 12 weeks from the immunization to the challenge and they called that um, durable protection. But obviously in a human vaccine, you know, we want to see protection lasting at least a year but ideally 10 years, and I guess the, the, in, a best, in a perfect world, we, we would like to see a vaccine give lifelong protection, just as we currently get from our hepatitis B vaccines and, and papillomavirus vaccines, where you just have a single course of immunization. So it will be very disappointing if we end up with vaccine candidates that only give us a few months protection. So, so in terms of technologies, I, would, I, I guess we, our hypothesis is that protein-based vaccines are the safest and most effective option to any pandemic solution, include, including COVID-19. Uh, we know they have an extraordinary safety profile, but also they are actually amongst the most effective vaccines that we have. So, so you're not compromising, you're getting benefits both from safety and also from effectiveness. So the way these are made is to make a synthetic uh, protein. Uh, then you have to combine it with an adjuvant because proteins themselves are quite inert immunologically. So you have to formulate with an adjuvant. And then the idea is this is given typically as an intramuscular injection. It can be given other ways, but this is the typical route. 
and you then induce antibodies against the virus, but importantly, hopefully with, with a good vaccine, induce uh, protective T cells uh, that are able to recognise uh, virally infected cells, mainly because antibodies can't in enter cells. So once a cell is infected, an antibody actually doesn't help uh, to control the virus. So, so essentially, uh, uh, most uh, uh, vaccines around the world for COVID-19 are focused on the spike protein, as I explained before. In our case, to make the synthetic gene, uh, we identified the spike protein uh, sequence from the genome. Uh, we then cut off the transmembrane domain to make the protein soluble, so it's easy to purify. Uh, we then express it uh, using a, a baclovirus transfection system to get it inside insect cells. So these insect cells then secrete the spike protein, which we can then uh, purify from the, the broth uh, that the cells are growing in. We then just formulate it with our adjuvant, uh, and this is essentially uh, the formulation that has been tested in, in animals uh, and more recently uh, in, in human subjects. We know this approach works because we did it with SARS coronavirus uh, many years ago uh, and showed that we could do the same approach using the spike protein uh, from SARS. Uh, we could formulate it with our adjuvant. Then when we challenged the animals with a lethal dose of SARS coronavirus, we found that there was no virus able to replicate in the animals that had received our vaccine. Uh, and similarly, when we did lung pathology on the animals after challenge, they had normal lungs, so there was no evidence of any lung pathology, so essentially complete protection. Um, so, so essentially, that's the platform that we've developed. Uh, so it's a synthetic protein. It's produced in insect cells. The same insect cells are used to produce Cervarix, which is the human papilloma virus vaccine that girls around, all around the world get to prevent cervical cancer. So we know it's a very safe uh, and effective platform. Uh, and as I'll show you, we've, we've now got data showing very strong uh, protection data in monkey and ferrets, uh, uh, including very old monkeys, which are replicating you know, humans at 80 or 90 years of age, which is the high risk group. Uh, we don't see really any side effects in, in the animals uh, from the vaccine. And similarly, uh, the phase one study I'm not talking about today has similarly shown uh, a lack of side effects of the vaccine. Uh, and essentially, this can be manufactured at large scale anywhere in the world. Um, so just a little bit of data then, because um, I don't like to sort of talk in generalities without giving you at least a sense of what our vaccine is doing. So this is a mouse immunogenicity study that we've done. Uh, this is just comparing the synthetic spike protein by itself and, and the adjuvanted spike protein in mice to look at the amount of, of antibodies against spike that we induce. And what you can see is we get nice production of antibodies against spike. We also get very strong memory CD4 T cell responses uh, in the vaccine group, uh, both CD4 and CD8, which are killer T cells that then will clear any virally infected uh, cells in the body. We know that it induces uh, a strong switch uh, to what we call a Th1 cytokine profile, uh, which is exemplified by cytokines like gamma interferon, which are extremely potent antiviral cytokines. So these are very important uh, in terms of protecting against viral infection. So we're, we're inducing the right type of T cells. Uh, we then immunized a, a, a colony of elderly monkeys that we maintain in the United States. Um, and we're able to show that with this vaccine uh, that we're able to induce again, just like in the mice, high levels of antibodies against the COVID-19 spike protein that were able, when you mix the, the sera from these animals with the live virus, were able to kill the live virus. So it wasn't able to actually infect cells uh, in, in, uh, in vitro. Um, we then challenged those animals uh, with a very high lethal dose of, of COVID-19 virus through three routes. So they were actually given virus into their eye, virus into their nose, and virus into their trachea, which is about as robust a challenge as you can imagine, uh, with a very high viral load. Uh, what we saw in, in the control animals that hadn't been immunized, 
uh, is that they actually got a florid uh, pneumonia and you can see here on post-mortem three and six days after uh, they'd been infected with the virus, you can see the lungs are grossly abnormal, comparing them to the normal lungs here uh, in, in the animals that had received the uh, uh, protein-based uh, vaccine where there was completely normal uh, lung pathology. Um, so then when they took samples of this lung to, to look at uh, whether the virus was replicating or not, uh, essentially what they found is that uh, the monkeys that were in the control group unimmunized both at day three and day seven after challenge had very high viral titers recoverable uh, from the lungs, uh, uh, whereas there was absolutely no recoverable virus in any of the immunized animals at either the day three or day seven time point. So essentially complete protection, despite the fact these animals were the equivalent of 80 year old uh, humans. Um, so that was obviously very uh, exciting. They also did a ferret challenge study along the same lines and again, uh, found that the, the ferrets that had been immunized with our vaccine uh, had completely normal lungs at post-mortem uh, and also uh, found, uh, and we're still waiting for the final data, but that the ferrets had no uh, virus uh, uh, in their nasal washes uh, relative to the vac non-vaccinated ferrets, uh, which did have virus. And this is in fact interesting because every other vaccine has not been able to show ability to prevent nasal uh, virus replication. So this could really be, I guess, a game changer. Obviously, we need to take this through clinical trials and most of you are aware, uh, David Gordon and, and his co-investigators have been running a, a phase one trial at the, the RA um, and uh, then we need to go into phase two and phase three studies uh, in order to make the vaccine more widely available. Um, so, so that's where we, we currently stand uh, today. Um, and just to, just to finish really a little bit of data to contrast, because this is the, the University of Queensland CSL vaccine, which the government's given you know, uh, over a billion dollars to support. Um, and the strongest data they, they've been able to show to date is in a hamster challenge model, uh, which is quite a weak model because the hamsters, even if you don't vaccinate them, uh, peak, their virus peaks at day two and then they actually clear the virus spontaneously. So they don't, unlike the monkeys, uh, where there's still very high virus in the lungs and they're obviously very sick at day seven, the hamsters actually don't really get sick with the virus, they clear it. So it's very hard to, to see the difference uh, when they vaccinate them in fact. And what you can see is that you can't tell any difference at day eight. There's no virus in any of the animals, including the control animals. So no differences. They do show at day four, slightly reduced virus in the lung, although they still do have virus in the lung of the vaccinated animals. Uh, and, and they show no reduction in amount of virus in the nose. So these animals are still infectious despite having been vaccinated with the Queensland vaccine. So it's really not going to be useful for preventing or achieving herd immunity because it doesn't look like it's actually going to stop people getting infected and transmitting the virus, even if it may reduce the, the incidence of uh, pneumonia. And this is really just highlighting that fact again, when they do histology at day four, unlike what we see in the monkeys, in the hamsters, they're seeing quite severe pathology in some of the vaccinated animals, uh, uh, which, which is as severe as those of the unvaccinated, although the trend is to less severe uh, lung disease in the vaccinated animals. So really a very weak uh, protective effect, if, if any. So I guess that's our closest competition. Um, Will initial COVID-19 vaccines remain effective? That's the big question because we know the virus is already mutating. Uh, there are several different strains of the virus now around the world. So far, we've been able to model these different mutations and our predictions are still that our vaccine will protect against all of them. <clears throat> but obviously we don't know going forward whether we might have to change the vaccine in a year's time, um, just like we do for flu. Uh, but if we do, fortunately, the platform we're using, the insect cell platform, is actually perfectly adapted to, to swap one strain in and, and, uh, for another, and that can be done in a few weeks. And 
and in fact the seasonal flu vaccine uh, made by Sanofi in the United States is made every year using the same platform we're using because you can change the the, the vaccine very rapidly if you need to, which you can't with, with say, technologies like University of Queensland, which uses stably transfected cells. So it takes six months potentially to make a new vaccine. So when will a COVID vaccine be available? I guess that's the $64,000 question. Uh, I think what we have to, to realise is that not all of the phase three trials are going to finish. Um, we've already got some in clinical hold. We, we, they, those clinical holds may or may not be released. Uh, we don't know. Uh, others may go into clinical hold because it's still a long way uh, before we, we have you know, sufficient, I guess, safety and efficacy data to make a conclusion uh, about which of these vaccines may succeed. So there are a lot of, I, I guess, hurdles still for every vaccine to, to overcome. They have to overcome this efficacy threshold that regulators have set of 50%, uh, which is, as I say, against viral infection, not against severe disease or mortality. Uh, some may fail just simply because people aren't satisfied as to their safety or they do really have a demonstrable safety issue. Uh, some may not be easy to manufacture at large scale in, in the billions of doses and therefore they might succeed in showing uh, efficacy, but you can't actually make enough of them. Others, the, they may sh show protection in the phase three temporarily and get approved, but then the protection wears off after a few months. And I guess that's one of the biggest concerns right now is about the durability and, and how do we establish that if we're going to approve vaccines in very short spaces of time. Uh, and, and finally, some may fail just because they design their trials wrongly and don't get it right. They measure the wrong thing and don't get the right p-value. So there's lots of pitfalls. Uh, we're assuming vaccines may need two doses, just like we've had to have two goes at this talk, as Jonathan was alluding to. Uh, we've seen single dose protection now in our ferrets, so there is the possibility, and we're gonna go back to the monkeys to actually do a single dose uh, vaccination then challenge to see if in fact we can get away with the single dose uh, and then of course you have the issue of how to manufacture billions of doses in a very short space of time and I think the conclusion overall is is certainly don't trust politicians when they tell you there's going to be a vaccine approved before the presidential election which is now only weeks away and I think we we can now all safely assume there won't be an approved vaccine uh, before next year. So just to finish, and uh, I guess thank uh, all of the phenomenal support we've had, uh, you know, from Flinders University, uh, you know, the Royal Adelaide Hospital, uh, the Kirby Institute in, in New South Wales, it's done all of our analytical work for the neutralisation assays, uh, you know, the US National Institutes of Health, who funded us for the last sort of almost 20 years uh, to get us to this point, uh, of course, all the clinical investigators, David, Pravin and Guy, who are running the phase one currently uh, at the RA, uh, Richard Woodman, who's been helping with the statistical design, and Dimitar, who's helped with the safety, uh, and obviously uh, the, the, the clinical uh, trial team at the RA, and of course, all my team here at, at uh, Flinders and, and uh, as part of the vaccine team, uh, who put all the science and uh, development uh, to the point where we hopefully will soon have an effective vaccine to show you uh, everything going to plan. So thank you very much. <coughs> Nick, that was great, thanks very much. I hope you just take a few questions. Um, but you emphasise safety and, and rightly so. Um, if I was doing an interventional drug trial, I'd be expected to do a power calculation and work out how many patients I should treat for a certain benefit. What, what about in a vaccine trial? How do you work out how many subjects you're going to, to test this on and look for safety signals? It's a very good question because <clears throat> obviously a lot of, of major safety issues are, are relatively rare. So, so the, the, the powering of a study to say, you know, for instance, the, the threshold of 3,000 subjects, which has been set by the FDA to even get emergency use authorization, assumes that a side effect is going to occur at least 
in, in one in a hundred subjects to get a statistical sense of is, is this increased in the vaccinated group. So, so it doesn't, it's not designed to pick up uh, events that happen in one in a thousand or one in 10,000 for which you would need to have hundreds of thousands of people in your study to power it. And of course that would just become too expensive. So with vaccines, what typically tends to happen is you, you, you get a marketing authorization, but then you have to do post-marketing surveillance. And I think for COVID, you would have to do very scrupulous post-marketing surveillance if you're gonna be giving these vaccines to hundreds of millions of people, you know, very rapidly so that the minute you, know, you did see any statistical anomaly where something was happening uh, at a higher rate than you might expect, that, that you know, potentially you might have to shut that vaccine down. Yep. So even if a vaccine gets approved, I don't think it's proved that it's safe, yep. to be honest, yep. because it can't. Yep. And so we have to accept that some vaccines may get six months into approval. Something you know, rare happens and, and we realise it's real, uh, and that vaccine's uh, off the market. Yep, understood. So it's very, I mean, politically, you know, quite explosive because yep. you can imagine one minute you're telling people we've solved the problem, we've got a fabulous vaccine, and six months later you're saying, sorry, you know, this has caused, you know, this rare disease, um, you know, and we're going to have to actually withdraw it. Yep, yep. Um, I guess one of the most striking things in the data you showed about your own uh, vaccine was the what seemed to be the absence of viral application, viral replication in your um, monkey and, and yep. uh, ferret models. Just expand on that for me. That's quite striking, isn't it? You're saying that other vaccines haven't achieved that effect. Did I hear that right? Yeah, so what the other vaccines have, have shown, uh, I mean, the Queensland's probably the weakest data I've seen, to be, to be frank. I mean, because a hamster is, as I say, it's a, it's a weak model to start with. It's, it's easy to cure them and, and they still don't fully cure them. So that's a problem. But with, with say, the Chinese vaccines and the Moderna vaccine and, and certainly the Oxford vaccine, what they showed was, was similarly a reduction in viral load in the lung of the challenged monkeys. Um, they certainly didn't get it down to zero, so it wasn't sterilizing immunity, but it was reduced, and the pathology in the lungs was reduced. But what they showed is they, they, they still had very high viral uh, loads in the nose. Uh, and that's because the mucosal immune system is actually almost a separate immune system to the sort of circulating immune system. And so you give an intramuscular vaccine, typically people think of that as protecting the lungs, but it, it, it doesn't mean you protect the mucosa. I, I guess what's, what's a game changer with our vaccine, and we've seen this you know, previously with a whole range of, of different challenge models, including Bordetella in dogs, uh, where it, it does appear to be able to actually clear the pathogen, not just systemically and keep it out of the lungs, but actually completely eradicate it from the whole body, including the mucosa. And the importance of that, of course, is if you, if you can stop people shedding virus from their nose, you're gonna stop transmission. Whereas the worry is with the other vaccines, yes, they might protect against serious illness in the person who got the vaccine, but it's not gonna stop that person. Tra so it's almost as bad as back to the asymptomatic carrier situation, well, these vaccines create lots of asymptomatic carriers and that's going to make it even harder to find and eradicate the virus from the community. Yep. So, so it could backfire. Okay. So I think sterilising immunity is it, it, both mucosally and systemically, you know, has to be the gold standard. And touch wood, so far, you know, that's what we're seeing with our vaccine. And any rationale behind that? Is it the adjuvant? Is it some, yep. wh why do you think you're getting some mucosal immunity with your yeah. uh, spike? Vaccine? So it, it, it's actually definitely the, the adjuvant because that's the common factor. When we did the Bordetella um, studies, which were done in, in France, in fact, um, independently, and they'd been had testing a whole range of different adjuvants in their Bordetella vaccine. Um, and some of them helped reduce, again, the, the clinical disease, so the cough in the dog, uh, but they'd never ever seen uh, a formulation that was able to actually cause clearance of the Bordetella from the nose because they, you know, they swabbed them over the 21 days. Uh, and only when they used our adjuvant did they see complete uh, loss of nasal carriage of the, the Bordetella. So, so it clearly is the adjuvant that's doing it, um, and, and again, how it's doing it, um, 
is, is I guess, a, a whole scientific project that's ongoing, yep. but, but it clearly is the adjuvant. Okay. Um, th you made a strong case for um, protein subunit vaccines, perhaps not surprisingly. Yes. But, um, <laughs> well, well, we did make a, an mRNA. I should say back in January, we made an mRNA vaccine, a DNA vaccine, yep. and a protein okay. vaccine, yeah, yeah. and tested them all, and the protein was clearly superior. So it wasn't that we just wedded to proteins because proteins are baby. Fair we enough. did actually explore the other technologies and decided they weren't as good. So ha having accepted that that might be the route to go, um, you've talked about the challenges of manufacture, number of doses that will be required. H how would you then, in an ideal world, select for the best technology from there to get lots? There's clearly lots of different ways to make protein. Just help us understand the, the pros and cons of some of those routes. All right, so, so I guess we're using um, insect cells. Um, and as I say, they're used for Cervix vaccine, which is a global vaccine, so, so it's a robust, and it's also used for seasonal influenza vaccine. Um, I guess the two strengths are it's much cheaper than mammalian cell culture, uh, which you know Queensland's using and Oxford's using, so they use mammalian cells. Um, and that's a lot more expensive, it's a lot more finicky. Mm -hmm. Um, obviously, the Catholic Church have recently come out against, um, you know, the hex cells, which are human embryonic kidney cells, because they came from an aborted fetus. So they have some sort of disquiet, I guess, if they're alternatives, and we know the Oxford vaccine is made in hex cells. Uh, Queensland is using Chinese ho ha hamster ovary cells, so, so I think less of an issue with with the Catholic Church, um, so there, there may be some ethical uh, issues. Um, you know, and then, then you have, you know, how robust is it? Like, like can you take it to a facility in every country and, and make it? Because some of these things are harder, mm -hmm. you know, to, to transfer, I guess. Uh, and, and again, the, both the mammalian and insect cells are, are used around the world. Uh, mammalian cells mainly for monoclonal antibodies. Um, Insect cells mainly for viral vector vaccines, mm. uh, not vaccines, for, for gene therapy, yep. um, as well as a few vaccines. So both platforms are pretty uh, amenable to large scale manufacture. Okay. Yep. Um, but, but as I say, there are subtle differences. The other thing is insect cells, because it's a transient transfection, you know, we can develop a new vaccine in two weeks. So if, if, if COVID mutates, in two weeks time, we can actually have a new product. Yep. Uh, on the shelves effectively. Yep. With the mammalian cells, because they're stable transfectants, that, that's a much longer process. So it probably won't be amenable uh, to rapid uh, ad adaptation if the virus mutates. Okay. So we think that's another major advantage of insect cells. Yeah, understood. Look, Nick, we, we might stop there. Thanks very much for, for all the time you've given to, to this presentation. <laughs> um, and. Uh, uh, look, we, we look forward to interest as this develops and uh, the best of luck as, as this goes forward. So thanks again. It's a pleasure.